Good morning. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Todd Hogriff. I'm the Central Region Director for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and I'll be leading us through the presentation today. The purpose of the webinar is to provide guidance to applicants on the 2018 funding opportunity for the Monarch Butterfly and Pollinators Conservation Fund. A few instructions before we begin. Um, all participants will be muted during the webinar. Um, if you have questions, we invite you to type them into the questions box on the control panel, which is typically on the right side of your screen. And uh, following the conclusion of the live program, we will be posting a recording of this webinar to our website, nfwf.org slash monarch. So if, you're, if anyone is not able to view this live, uh, they'll be able to view it later for reference. Here is an agenda of the webinar. I'll start with an overview of the fund, then I'll, I'll move into the details of the 2018 funding opportunity. Uh, and then after that, I'll be providing some specific guidance on the application process. I will be breaking uh, two, two times for questions. So as I said, if, if any occur to you, don't hesitate to, to type them and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the, the monarch butterfly and other pollinators have been undergoing some very serious declines over recent decades. The, the monarch butterfly itself has undergone approximately an 80% decline of its population on its Mexican wintering grounds. Um, we have less information available for, for many other pollinator species, but it's evident that they're facing similar challenges. Um, in response to these threats, um, NIFWIF and a host of partners established the Monarch Butterfly Conservation Fund in 2015. Uh, the purpose of that fund is to advance the conservation of monarchs and other at-risk native insect pollinators. And we've, we've been trying to do that uh, with the, the benefit of funding support and other resources from a host of public and private partners, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, Monsanto Company, U.S. Forest Service, the BLM, USGS, and NRCS, and I'm very pleased to say that in 2018, the Shell Oil Company has joined us as a, a program partner on the fund. So we, we very much appreciate their support this year. This slide summarizes the investments of the fund over its first three years. Um, as you can see on the map on the right, which shows project locations, we've been very focused on supporting projects located within the Monarch Eastern Migratory corridor, as well as some key habitat areas in the western United States. Since 2015, we've supported 70 grants worth $11.1 .1 million. Grantees are matching that with an additional $18.1 million for a total on-the-ground investment of $29.2 million over the first three years. And that investment is generating some important benefits to monarchs and other pollinators, including uh, improving upwards of 127,000 acres, the collection of more than 13,000 pounds of milkweed seed and other nectar plant seed, the propagation of 730,000 milkweed seedlings, and then the hosting and coordination of 730 pollinator-related workshops. We're looking to build on that impact in 2018. Um, those of you familiar with the program will, will have noted the, uh, the name change this year. We added the term pollinators to the title of the program to reflect a, a gently expanding program scope. Uh, the, the fund was conceived with the idea that the work we do for monarchs will also benefit many pollinators, but uh, now we're trying to be more explicit about that. Uh, we're, we're going to retain our focus on monarchs, but, but increase the focus on capturing and highlighting the benefits to other at-risk native pollinators. So this year, um, in addition to monarch projects, projects for other federally listed and candidate insect pollinator species are also eligible. And I do predict that this year the most competitive projects will be those that simultaneously benefit monarchs as well as other at-risk species. Some details about the, the 2018 funding opportunity. We re released the request for proposals last Wednesday, and you can find that at nfwf.org slash monarch. There is a pre-proposal stage. Uh, pre-proposals are due on Wednesday, March 14th. Invited full proposals will be due on Tuesday, May 8th, and then um, we do anticipate announcing grant awards 
in mid-August. This year, we expect to award up to $1.6 million. The grant size of, uh, range will be $50,000 to $150,000. Uh, that reflects a change since last year. Last year, the ceiling was $250,000, so the, the cap this year is, is a bit lower, so make note of that. And a one-to-one -one non federal match is also required. Eligible applicants may include nonprofit organizations, federal, state, tribal, and local governments, and educational institutions. Um, grant funds may not be used for political advocacy, fundraising, or lobbying. They can't be used for litigation or legally mandated mitigation projects. So, Geographic focus. Um, each year, we award grants uh, with funding from a variety of different sources, each of which has its own intended set of uh, uses and restrictions. In past years, we have, have, we have had funding that allowed us to invest in projects internationally in Canada and Mexico. Unfortunately, in 2018, um, our funding sources uh, don't allow us to do that, so this year, Projects must occur only in the United States. We are hopeful that in future years we will be able to invest again in Mexico and Canada because we see a lot of value in those projects and we, we don't want to give the impression that we, we think they're unimportant because we, we certainly do. Um, within the United States, we expect that much of our funding will continue to be spent within the, monarch butterf the core areas of the monarch butterfly range. We're gonna be emphasizing the Eastern Migratory Flyway and 16 uh, key states that we're highlighting are listed here on the screen. Um, we're also um, looking to invest in key areas along the for the for the Western Monarch population, specifically on or adjacent to lands um, managed by the U.S. Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, as well as um, at overwintering sites for the monarch butterfly. Eligible lands. Um, We've, we've got a pretty broad reach here. Hopefully you'll see yourself in one of these categories. Um, but to summarize, eligible lands for projects include federal, state, and tribal lands. It does, they do include local government lands. There was an oversight in the RFP that seemed to omit local government lands. That certainly was not our intent. They are eligible. Um, rights of way for transmission, pipeline, rail, roadside, et cetera, are of interest to us. Agricultural lands other private lands, and then again, Western habitats, on or near Forest Service or BLM lands, and then Western Monarch overwintering sites. So uh, hopefully you do see yourself somewhere in that list. With that geographic focus and within those eligible land categories, we are looking to fund work primarily in two categories, habitat improvement and outreach and organizational coordination. So, in past years, we have seen proposals that seem to stretch a bit to, to cover both of these categories when maybe it wasn't a natural fit. So here I want to emphasize that strong focused outcomes in a single category will tend to compete better than a less focused project that spans both categories. So stay true to the project, I guess, is, is the message. Within the habitat improvement category, the goal is to increase quality, quantity, and connectivity of monarch and pollinator habitat. Key strategies here include restoring and enhancing habitat with emphasis on milkweed and a diversity of nectar plants. If, uh, another strategy is increasing native seed and seeding supply with emphasis on improving sustainability and affordability, and then also protecting and improving overwintering sites. Beyond these key strategies, if you're proposing a project um, that intends to benefit other species beyond monarchs, you might want to tailor some strategies specifically to those species needs. For example, if you're focused on native bees, you might want to ensure, uh, demonstrate how you're ensuring that there'll be adequate nesting sites for, for species. Within this category, we ask you to define the step-by-step -step restoration planning, including elements such as how the site will be prepared, the project size, techniques used, the maintenance plan, et cetera. And then if your project includes collection of seed or propagation of seedlings, we'd ask you to describe the intended use of the seed or seedlings. 
The goal of the Outreach and Organizational Coordination category is to align and expand monarch and pollinator conservation efforts across organizations, states, and regions. Key strategies here include coordinating state and regional consortia focused on monarch and pollinator conservation, supporting positions and programming that is additive, and promoting the application of best management practices. Within the application, you'll be asked to report your projected outcomes in terms of a set of metrics that essentially fall in three categories. The first is uh, in the category of restoring or enhancing habitat. Here we'll ask you for acres restored, acres enhanced, and if you're doing work on patches less than an acre in size, we'll ask you for the number of patches you'll be working on. For um, milkweed and plant supply, we'll ask you to indicate the pounds of milkweed seed you, you expect to collect, the pounds of other nectar seed you expect to collect, and then the number of seedlings propagated. For outreach and organizational coordination, some of the key metrics include number of workshops hosted, number of full-time employees hired or sustained with grant funding, and then the number of people engaged. For each of these metrics, there will be a set of guidance um, in, in the system. We encourage you to read that guidance so you get a clear picture of what we're really after with each of these metrics. Okay, so that was a bit of an overview for our priorities and eligibility. Um, after this, I'm gonna move into details of the application process, but right now I wanted to break uh, and see what sort of questions we have. So let me let me pull those up. First question is, uh, and I'm just going to read these verbatim. As far as local government lands are concerned, would vacant lands owned by a county land bank that are open to pollinator beneficial flower plantings be eligible? Yes, that seems like it would be a good fit. For, for this funding. So simple answer, that, seems, that, that qualifies. So it looks like we have some questions about match coming in. I'm going to defer on those uh, until a bit later because I'm going to answer that with, with some subsequent slides. So just uh, hang tight with those. And then the question is, uh, for outreach efforts, can your efforts be regional, national, international and still qualify? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, we, we would want to see, I'm afraid that this year I have to say that we'll need to see those outreach efforts concentrated or uh, let's say exclusively occurring within the United States. Um, so uh, we can talk through that a bit more if, if, you, if the questioner wanted to give me a call. Um, I, I see there's ways to have some spillover benefits into the international areas, but we'd want the work itself to be focused within the United States. So, are golf courses owned and operated by park districts eligible? Yes, absolutely. I think that screen keeps bouncing around. It's hard for me to read one. Um, So are there any geographic preferences within the named states? Would a multi-state or national project be more competitive? I think that really depends on the nature of the work. So if we're talking about uh, developing a regional strategy, then uh, naturally a, a multi-state effort would be more appealing. Um, if it was more focused on individual uh, patch restorations, I think uh, we'd want to see what sort of overriding strategy there is to, to make the project hang together as a whole. Uh, for example, there's the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which gets at cities really uh, across the country to improve monarch habitat, but that's under a, some sort of unifying umbrella. I guess the point is, is that we would want to make sure that uh, there, these weren't projects being done in isolation without a, a common theme, um, but rather one that um, could advance some common objectives. So I think the answer is is, is generally yes, multi-state, multi-region projects are appealing, but the structure of the project really matters.
So the question is, are uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers eligible? So, yeah, so, and a lot, of time, a lot of times with our programs, federal agencies themselves are not eligible um, grant recipients. That is not the case with this program. So the Army Corps um, is, is, in fact, eligible. So interested to see what, what they would like to propose. Bear with me while I scroll through here. Question is, uh, do all of the seeds need to be native or can we incorporate others? So we, we do strongly encourage using local ecotypes to the extent possible, all right? Recognizing that there are limitations on availability in, in many places. Um, that's, that's the sort of detail that we'd like to explore with an applicant, so uh, talking with, with that person um, directly would be helpful, but uh, failing that, certainly explaining the source of the seed in the pre-proposal or proposal narrative would be very important. Question here is, does the seed supply project also have to restore or enhance habitat, or can it stand alone? Uh, we, we, you certainly can have a standalone seed supply project, um, but as I mentioned, we'd want to have a clear picture on how those seeds will be used in the future. Um, but yeah, certainly a, a, seed, a seed project could stand on, it, on its own. So for habitat improvement, are projects on multiple land types more competitive? Uh, that is local parkland and agricultural buffers. We, we like to see a diversity of lands incorporated into projects. I, I don't think it gives, gives a project a, a leg up on, on others per se, but uh, it, it's certainly something that, that interests us. Um, you shouldn't try to move heaven and earth to make that happen if it's not a natural fit, but if you've got some opportunities, then all the better. So for, for the outreach efforts, does it need to be on the ground efforts immediately? Would research into improving these efforts also be acceptable? That's a, that's a great question because <laughs> we're very interested in, uh, in, in, in what this, all this outreach and coordination ultimately leads to. We want it to touch the ground um, in some direct fashion um, b before long, but research into how to make that happen and, and how to attract those results would be, is, is a very interesting topic for us. So I'm, I'm open to it. I certainly would like to learn more about that idea. Um, so whoever wrote that question, if you want to reach out to me, I'd, I'd really enjoy chatting with you. So for seed and seedling projects, can the seedlings be used for school grounds with students leading the process? Yes, we'd, of course we'd want to make sure that the students are properly trained, you know, planting a lot of these, these uh, milkweed and, and nectar plants can be a little tricky, they can be kind of finicky. Um, we want to make sure that they're planting them in the proper way to maximize the chance of germination and growth, of course, but that's certainly something that is eligible under this program. Appreciate your patience while I kind of try to filter the ones that are best answered now versus ones that I might get at later with my slides. Okay, question here is, have states outside of priority areas ever received funding? So in the past when we've 
focused more explicitly on monarchs, we've received a handful of proposals each year from states that were outside the core monarch areas. And we've, we've looked at those very carefully. We've, we, we weighed their merits, but ultimately we decided to um, limit our investments to those, 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 those core areas that you saw on the map. So they have not fared well in the past. This year though, with our broader focus on, on other federally listed species and candidate species, I think there is more opportunity um, to do that. So if you really demonstrate uh, a, a need for other species and can link that to benefits to monarch, I think you stand a higher chance of getting funded. Um, that said, um, I think we are predicting that we will continue to spend the bulk of our funding within those core monarch areas. So it, it's really really your call as to whether you want to float a pre-proposal to see how it shakes out. Answer, I'll answer a couple more here, and then I'll, I'll move on to the, the remainder of my slides. How do prescribed burning projects to enhance habitat typically rank? Some, some of uh, the projects that have yielded the biggest acreage for us have involved habitat management techniques such as prescribed burning. So we're, um, we've we funded a lot of uh, habitat enhancement in the form of burning, uh, grazing, mowing. So all of those things are certainly eligible and they, they tend to give us um, our, our bigger acreages. So we have a, a, a sharp eye for projects like that. So they tend to fare pretty well. How many proposals did we receive last year? If I remember correctly, I think we got 147 pre-proposals and that was a big jump from the previous year because last year we added the pre-proposal phase which made it a little bit easier to apply so I think we saw a bit more interest and in years prior to that we received I think uh, in the ballpark of a hundred uh, full proposals per year so uh, got 147 last year and ultimately we funded I think 22 23 so uh, a success rate of, of under 20%, but for the program as a whole, I think the success rate has hovered just at about 20%. Okay, so there are quite a lot of questions, um, you know, dozens, if not more than 100 questions here that I haven't gotten to, but I'm afraid I need to move on to, uh, to the remainder of the slides. And uh, I do want to point out that if we, if I do not get to all your questions in the live presentation here that I will send email responses um, as soon as possible, though given the, the number it might take, take some amount of time. Okay, so moving on. The application process. All applications must be submitted online through NIFWIF's Easy Grants system. That can be found at easygrants.nifwif.org. Uh, I want to point out that we recently made a video tutorial of how to navigate Easy Grants and, and perhaps do a little troubleshooting if you run into some issues. Right now that just lives on a Vimeo, uh, the Vimeo website, and I'm gonna give you a minute to write down this URL. It's, it's vimeo.com slash 251-322-579. Okay. So, as I mentioned, there is a pre-proposal phase. Uh, they are due on March 14th. Uh, there are three elements that you'll need to provide at that stage. The first is the, the narrative, and that can be up to three pages of text. There is a template that's provided to you in, in uh, Easy Grants, and you'll need to use that. There are, are five sections in the narrative you'll need to complete. The first is funding category. You'll need to indicate which category best represents your, your project. Is it habitat improvement? or is it outreach and, and coordination? Next, you'll need to provide context. You'll need to describe the activities your project involves and what outcomes are expected to, to result from those activities. And then there's a section, an optional section for other, anything else you wish to share at that time. We'll ask you to upload a map of the project site and also provide letters of support, particularly from um, landowners um, where any habitat work might occur. We want to make sure that they're on board before we get too far down the road. 
At the full proposal stage, there's a number of additional uploads. There's a full proposal narrative that can be up to uh, six pages. Uh, we'll ask you to include a project map and, and additional letters of support. There is a statement of litigation and a template is provided for that. As applicable, you'll need to indicate who's on your board of trustees or board of directors. You'll need to upload your GAAP audited financial statements, your IRS Form 990 if you're a nonprofit, and then your A133 audit statement. And then we'll also request more detailed information about your project budget and match. We provide detailed guidance on how to complete the budget um, at the link shown on the screen. This, there's also a hyperlink to this, um, this address in the RFP, so you don't need to write this down now unless you want to. But in, in the budget, you'll need to enter information on salaries and benefits, equipment, contractual services, supplies and materials, printing, travel, indirect costs, and other. Um, indirect costs are eligible provided they conform to NIFWF's indirect policy, which you can find at, at this site listed here. Again, that's, that is uh, available in the RFP. It might actually be a little bit hard to find. I noted this morning, it's actually on page five. There's a hyperlink for it on page five of the RFP. And one last note on the budget, the budget must comply with OMB uniform guidance. And again, there is a link for that in the RFP. So match, there's always a lot of interest in match, a lot of questions about match. Hopefully I can get at a lot of the questions that I've seen uh, typed in already. But uh, matching funds of at least one-to-one in -one non-federal funds will be required. Matching contributions may include cash, staff and volunteer time, work performed, mater uh, materials and services donated, cost of land acquisition easement, allowable indirect costs not covered by grant funding, and then other tangible contributions to project goals. Match must be verifiable from the grantee's records. It cannot be included as contributions for any other award. It must be necessary and reasonable for accomplishment of the project or program objectives. It must be allowable costs based on the program and funding source guidelines. And it must be committed directly to the project and must be used within the period of performance. Speaking of which, we have some flexibility here, but the duration is typically two years, or, or we can time it to accommodate two full field seasons. The, we're asking our applicants to indicate a start date no earlier than August 1st, 2018. We have some restrictions on how early the date can be based on when our funding becomes available. So our, our guidance here is to, to not proceed August 1st. And then the match that you offer must be spent between the project start and end dates that you specify in your, your grant application. And those dates will be incorporated into, will be incorporated into the eventual grant agreement. So give some thought to what you'd like those to be. Some other, other notes, we, a significant portion of our program funding is federal in origin. Of, and some of that funding is subject to some regulatory compliance requirements. Uh, we need to do some documentation for projects for, for that funding. Um, so there is a decent chance that if you receive the grant, you, you need to work with us to do some uh, documentation for the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Natural Historic Preservation Act. Um, so applicants should um, anticipate some time needed to complete that work. Before and that will have to be done before work can begin on the ground. Our grant awards are, are primarily reimbursable and grantees may request reimbursement at any time after a grant agreement is finalized. So you can uh, invoice us really as frequently as you wish and we actually uh, encourage grantees to invoice us um, as frequently as they can um, just so we can start drawing funding down. Here's a summary of the timeline. This is a bit of, of a, a refresher from what we've already seen. The pre-proposals will be due on March 14th prior to midnight. Uh, we will review those and then invite full proposals on April 9th. Full proposals will be due on May 8th prior to midnight. And then after that, we will review the full proposals um, between mid-May and mid-August. And then we anticipate announcing grant awards in mid-August provided all of our funding arrangements are in place. 
There are a number of places where you can find additional information about the program and the funding opportunity. Your best source of information is really the request for proposals. That's the best document that outlines what it is we're after. So we really encourage you to read it carefully. On the website with the RFP, there's also an application tip sheet that gets into a bit more of the details about how to apply for a NIFWF grant. On the website, there's also uh, links to projects funded over the first three years of the fund. So you might want to check those out and see what has really grabbed our interest in the past. As I said, this webinar is being recorded and we'll post the recording on the website, hopefully by this afternoon. If you get into the, um, the application process and you run into some, some issues, maybe you're having some technical difficulties, we have an Easy Grants help desk. You can reach them via email or via phone using the info on the screen. If you do reach out to them um, in your voicemail or in your email, please include your name, your proposal ID number, your email and, and phone info, the program this is relevant to and then the issue you're having. That will really help them uh, get at it in a timely manner. And then um, NIFWF staff is an important resource for you, uh, namely myself. I'm the main um, project contact for this funding opportunity. So if you have questions about the application process, uh, or if you'd just like to run a project idea by me, don't hesitate to, to contact me. The next slide actually uh, shows my contact information. Um, always happy to, to chat. And we'll, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So um, look, looking forward to hearing from, from a lot of you, hopefully. So with that, I can, I can revisit the questions that have been coming in. So let's see what we have. All right, let's start from the top. Are at-risk native pollinators restricted to federally listed or candidate species, or can they include other species categorized as at-risk by NatureServe? That's a, that's a great question. So we see 2018 as really a, a pilot effort um, where we're sort of testing this expanded approach. So we're, we're going to have a lot to learn, and um, we'll, we'll hopefully learn, you know, take those lessons learned and apply them to the next year's funding cycle. But this year, if um, someone wanted to uh, present a, a standalone project for another species that did not include monarchs, we would want it to we would want to see it focused on federally a federally listed species or a candidate species. That said, if the project has benefits to um, monarchs, um, we're very open to broadening that suite of other, what we're considering at risk native species. So a uh, project in the monarch range that's benefiting monarchs can, can you, you can demonstrate benefits to a host, host of species and they don't have to necessarily be federally listed or candidate species. Kind of mumbled through that, but I think you get the idea. Are multiple grant applications from one organization acceptable? Yes, so there's no limit on how many applications a single organization can submit. Um, in, it's possible to receive more than one, for an organization to receive more than one grant in a single funding cycle. I'm struggling to remember whether that's happened in this program. It's rare, but it's certainly possible, and it has happened through other programs at least. So um, we, we encourage you to always put your best foot forward, though. Don't throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. You know, if you have 10 ideas, you might want to select your top two, something like that. Are restorations on city parks eligible? Yes, absolutely. Are the projects to be started and completed in 2018? Is there another round for projects starting in 2019? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so we expect to uh, announce awards in uh, August of 2018. We, we schedule this to give our grantees the fall and the winter to uh, complete any required compliance documentation requirements. So it's really our expectation that most of the projects will begin on the ground work in earnest starting in spring of 2019. So no, we don't expect these projects to be done, done in 2018. 
and the grant durations tend to be two two years or so, so really multiple seasons to get that work done. And um, we do we do expect there to be another round of, of funding in 2019. Are the targeted pollinator species all listed in the RFP? No, they're not. We didn't want to be that prescriptive. Um, you can go to the Fish and Wildlife Service website their endangered species website, and they've, they've got a, a list of species which you can actually support by taxon group. I believe you can support uh, sort by insects to give you an idea of, of what might be in the wheelhouse here, but no, that's not something we've included in the RFP itself. Are you funding monitoring this year. Um, in the past, we have provided support to develop monitoring protocols, um, not really for the on-the-ground monitoring itself. Monitoring is a bit of a challenge for us timing-wise. We are very interested in monitoring the habitats that we've helped restore with our funding as they mature, as they're established and as they mature. And as, as you all know, it takes multiple years for that to happen. And given a two-year two, two year grant, it's tough to incorporate the on-the-ground habitat work with, with monitoring that will need to happen years later. So that's something we're working through. Um, the grants that we supported in 2015, maybe just now, are coming into their own. Maybe even maybe they might even take another field season yet. But we will be looking to support monitoring of those habitats um, down the road, but not, not quite yet. Can funds be used to upgrade greenhouses like add water or electricity? That Those elements can be part of a, a project, yes. So provided all that work can be tied to the, the production of a certain um, estimated amount of, of um, seedlings, for example, then that's those are eligible expenses. Um, we, we wouldn't want to fund up, upgrades to a greenhouse just for their own sake. We'd want to see that connection to, to pollinator or monarch benefits. So you want to make sure you make that tie in your proposal. Can grant funding be used to purchase equipment such as tractors that will be used to improve habitat? The short answer is, is yes. Um, things get a little complicated when you use federal funds to purchase equipment like that. So we'd want to see the, the need and the benefit very clearly. But, but yeah, that's something that is, is eligible. Can private companies with nurseries qualify for grant monies for milkweed and nectar species Increase production and collections to make seed to make to make available for sale. Uh, For-profit companies are not eligible to receive grant funding directly. Um, in this situation, a more appropriate grant recipient would be a nonprofit partner. Um, it's not uncommon for a, a nonprofit to receive a grant and then subcontract or subgrant to a con um, a consultant or a private company to assist with the effort, but um, a private nursery, um, a for-profit nursery itself could not apply. Can some outreach money be spent on website upkeep as well as further education if, if a website is already in place? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I think that would be received best if it was a relatively small portion of, of a total budget. Um, we we want to see how the work we fund is really additive to what's already out there. And uh, this would seem to be, this sort of thing would seem to be in support of something that's already out there. But if, if it could be used to build or expand into new areas, that, that could be more appealing. A lot of questions to match. Hopefully, I've, I've answered the bulk of your questions on, on those. 
can we work with a grower that has already started creating habitat but has not seeded his site? Yeah, yeah, we don't have to start um, from step one in our project, so if progress has already been made, all the better. Can I put the outreach goal strategy back up? Sure. There you go. I'll leave that up there for a little bit. Another question about uh, developing a greenhouse. Yep, that's that's eligible. Just need to tie it directly to benefits to monarchs and pollinators. Do you support projects that have comprehensive pre-project monitoring so that real change in post-project monitoring can be shown? That that is the like <laughs> the best possible situation if if there were data available prior to projects such that we could demonstrate the impact that we've had, then that's that's fantastic. Um a lot of times that's not the case, but um that that would be a big selling point and highlighting that in your narrative would be would be a good thing to do. Does the grant need to be approved before we can start any ground prep? We have the op, we can reimburse you. Well, depends on when that work is started. So we can reimburse you um, for work I'm sorry, I'm stumbling through this, but let's give you an example. So if you were given a grant, announced that you were going to get a grant award in mid-August, but you listed your start date as August 1st, and then you didn't get a grant agreement in place till say, end of September, for whatever reason, you have the option of doing work starting from August 1st and then requesting reimbursement for that funding from us once the grant agreement is in place. Okay, But it's really up to you and your comfort level um, in doing work and incurring expenses before your grant agreement is finalized. So yeah, you, you've, you've got that option, but it's really your call, call as whether or not you want to do that. Forest Service and BLM lands are mentioned as eligible land categories. What about National Park Service land in Colorado? So the reason we, we call out um, funding, uh, call out um, Forest Service and BLM lands is because you know, we have funding specifically for that, that use. We have other funding that can be used more broadly. So um, work in Colorado, you know, on or near um, National Park lands is eligible as well. So, you know, we don't have a specific funding source tailored to that type of land, but it, it's certainly eligible. Someone noted that uh, they can't seem to find, you know, other pollinators that are endangered in in Kansas in this case, you know, other, um, and, and that that may be the case in in a lot of areas that you're working. That there there aren't, you know, hundreds of of listed pollinator insect species um, under the ESA. Uh, there, I think there's something like. 50 insects or so that might be considered to be pollinators that are that are listed. So it might be hard to find a connection, but as I said earlier, if you're working in monarch territory, 
and you can find benefits to other native pollinators that aren't necessarily you know, listed or candidates but are of some concern and you can demonstrate benefits to them, then that's to your advantage. So if the city applied to the Five Star Urban Waters Restoration Grant Program, which is another NIFWF program, are we still eligible to apply uh, to this opportunity? Um, yes, uh, I, you know, those funding opportunities are staggered, so I think we'll have some results for the Five Star Program uh, prior to the decisions on the Monarch Program. Um, so your outcome for this opportunity might hinge upon how it's received under Five Star, but you certainly no problem applying to both. So if the two if 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 the two are related, I guess if the two project elements are related, can you apply for both categories together in one application? Absolutely. So in in the narrative, you can indicate a primary funding category, the the one category that best reflects your project, and then also indicate that you know the other is a secondary category. Um, I, I made the comment earlier about not stretching to try to touch on both if it's not a natural fit, but if, if it is a natural fit, then all the better. Don't hesitate to, to emphasize both elements. So if we've applied in the past and been turned down, can we talk with someone at the foundation to get some insight as to what the strengths and weaknesses were? Yes, absolutely. So all you have to do is uh, send me an email or, or give me a call and I can pull up our notes we have from the past cycle and, and let you know what our reviewers had to say about it. If we apply for funding under the restoration category, can we use the funds to purchase, addition, purchase educational signage on the restored habitat and benefiting pollinators? Yeah, signage is an eligible expense. No problem with that. If we have land currently in the CRP, could that land be developed into a monarch pollinator habitat? We currently have grass in that area. Yeah, making the connection between that federal program and, and this fund is, is a natural fit. So that's not... Uh, in no way a disqualifier, it might be to an advantage. Is 50,000 the minimum grant amount? It is. Um, it, it, it's not an absolute floor. You know, I can imagine a situation where a smaller grant might be appealing. Um, but we're, we're really encouraging our applicants to stick within that $50,000 to $150,000 window. Um, if you do dip below that, we'd really need to see a, a very good reason why, why it's uh, of a smaller nature. And as an alternative, you might consider enlisting other partners maybe to broaden the scope a bit to bump that, the total ask up to, to be in that recommended window. Is regional defined as multi-state? I wouldn't say we have a real definition for that, but when I say, say regional, personally, I think of multiple states. So yeah, that's my, my rule of thumb. So is there a, a review team of the pre-proposals and what entities are involved? So each of our program partners has a representative, at least one representative on our review team. So when the pre-proposals are submitted, we, NIFWF, will share them with all of our, our program funding partners. You saw the logos on one of the early slides. And then we'll convene 
uh, you know, they'll submit their reviews to us, we'll compile them, and then we'll convene as a group and, and come to consensus on the best projects to invite forward. And I think, to, to build on that, I, I think the fact that we have such a diverse set of funding partners is a great advantage to us. I think it, because we have so much diverse expertise on the team, it helps us make better decisions in the end. So I think it's a really, really good process that we've developed. Might research on already restored lands or recently restored lands be be funded? I don't think we're quite there yet. I think this year we're going to stick closely to our two named funding categories. Um, we, you know, I, I'd be interested in talking about the idea um, for sure, but I, I this is not really a funding opportunity suited to to research. But uh, as we become a more mature program, we are going to be moving more more of our, our investments into the monitoring side and research will have a role to play in that. So um, the, the questioner here might want to reach out to me directly. Some pretty specific questions here um, that I'm going to respond to later offline uh, via email because uh, I think it's more suited to that, the one on one interaction. So I'm going to not get to those right now. So I hope that's okay with the, the questioners. So, what is the deadline for the one to one match? So as I said, um, the match needs to be a spent or otherwise applied to the project between the start and end dates in, specified in the uh, project proposal. And we do have a limit on how, um, how early you can start the project. So we're, August 1st would be the, the soonest we want you to list as the, the start date. Will an FDE hired to implement an existing plan be well received? Um, in the abstract, I, there's there's not a real obstacle there. Um, I'd, I'd like to know what kind of work it is, and, and is this uh, you know new work? Is it additive, or is it sort of implementing something that's been been done for a long time? So I guess the the newness and the, the additive nature of the work would be the key factor there. So you've given out more grants focused on habitat in the past. Is that indicative of a preference on this outcome or simply due to past submission? I think it's right that the majority of our funding, you know, maybe let's say 60% of our funding has gone toward habitat restoration with the remainder going toward uh, activities more focused on outreach co coordination. Um, I think we started with an emphasis on habitat restoration, and we have some internal objectives to, to meet on that front. But I think some of the most exciting work that we've funded has been on the outreach and coordination side of things, the way we're, you know, the projects that we've funded and, and how our partners are, are really catalyzing new action and engaging so many new people in this effort. That, that sort of result is a little bit harder to quantify, and we're, we're really trying to get at that. But it's, I think it's one of the bigger benefits of this program. So I think we might see more and more of an emphasis on, on that sort of sort of work. So hopefully that encourages you to, to pursue that line of thinking. Would promotion and training for citizen science efforts around monarchs apply? Uh, 
apply for funding. Yeah, that's, that is certainly an eligible activity, something we'd have an interest in. Would invasive species removal be acceptable? Yeah, that's, that's part of the, the comprehensive restoration approach that we'd like to see for a lot of our projects. So it's not just about, you know, planting, planting the appropriate ecotypes in the right places, but it's also prepping the site in, in the way that's needed to make it um, um, conducive to establishing high quality habitat for monarchs and other pollinators. So, so absolutely. Would expansion to a previously funded project by another agency be eligible? Sure, no problem there. I guess if, if that's the case, we'd like to see um, what's been accomplished up to this point and how the, the new grant funding would build on those results. So that'd be important to touch on in the context section of the, uh, of the, the, the narrative. A lot of questions about geographic eligibility, and I think I've, I've, I've answered that a bit. Um, so I, because there's so many, I might just want to reiterate that you know, most of our funding will be spent within the, the core monarch areas. But if you've got a project outside of that, we'd want to see a connection uh, to a, a clearly demonstrated need for other priority species. Um, really uh, in this, this pilot year, those that are either fairly listed or, or candidate species. Trying to find, we have maybe time for one more. I'm trying to find the best one. So we'll not, well, not being able to include federal funding, a federal entity can still be the applicant, correct? Yep, I've touched on that already. Um, but uh, yeah, federal agencies can apply. We've made a number of grants to the Fish and Wildlife Service, for example, in past years. Let's see one more. So what about efforts to prioritize pollinator plantings and do outreach and implement pollinator planning on private and urban properties? Completely eligible. Um, we, we've invested heavily in the Mayor's for Monarch Pledge and some other urban work, so it is of, of interest to the program. I guess we've, we, we've stopped short of listing it specifically in the RFP as a priority, but um, our grant making pattern over the past three years would suggest that we, we do have a great interest in it. So. Uh, we'd expect uh, expect to continue in that vein. So if you've got an idea, I'd love to love to see it. Okay. Well, um, I guess I left that slide up there for longer than I expected. But quickly going back to, oops, sorry, to uh, this slide. Again, this is my contact information. I encourage you to reach out to me if you have questions about uh, the process or your, your project idea, or if you want feedback on past projects. Um, we're expecting to receive quite a few proposals this year. Happy to see what, excited to see what we get in. Uh, I appreciate everyone's attention today for this webinar. I know I didn't get to all the questions. Um, I will be responding to, to each of them uh, individually uh, via email over the next uh, couple days. So I appreciate your patience on that. Um, again, thanks for your attention. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Have a good day.